Okay, we're back to work on this uh, Premier Power Welder in the uh, the LJ Rubicon on 40s. I'm just jumping up on the trailer here because I haven't taken it off the trailer. So I played with a few different ways of mounting it, and um, I don't know if you remember from earlier in the video, I had my regulator and solenoids for my ARB lockers mounted off of the bracket up here. This is actually the PSC bracket that they supply for the reservoir, but I opted to put it a lot closer to the pump with a shorter, more direct hose um, that should maintain elevation above the pump at all angles for the most part. Um, putting it back here, especially on this side of the, uh, the brake mount massive cylinder ends up making that hose pretty long and, uh, you know, on steep climbs, it kind of puts that hose at a disadvantage where it's not really a, a very steep downward grade into the pump. The pump does a really good job of pushing. It doesn't do a lot of suction. So, um, a lot of people that have problems with power steering, um, it, it's because they're starving the pump. They're ending up with problems with feeding the pump. So I have a much shorter run with a pretty steep incline. You know, if I could, putting the reservoir directly on top of that would be great, but not going to happen. Anyway, um, I've been trying to figure out the best way to put this thing in here, and it's just a big box. It's not small. The mini would be probably a lot easier to mount, but then you lose the power outlet. And I was greedy. I wanted that power outlet. Um, if I absolutely had to, I could make it fit on the other side, but it would be covering the battery. It would be obscuring the terminals, and I don't want to do that for safety reasons. I want to be able to access those terminals uh, very easily. So I'm trying to keep it on this side of the engine bay. The battery, uh, the power cables are going to be at a disadvantage because they come out of this side of the box, so they're going to have to kind of go off to the right towards the, the firewall to get across and then go left again. Um, I may have to get uh, a little bit creative. I may end up running a brace across these braces uh, with some cushion clamps and then I can zip tie the cables across on that. I don't want them I don't want them just hanging there. That's not a good way to do electrical. Uh, they, they should be at least supported. Like even the, the harness running across the firewall has several zip ties across the way. So it's not just hanging out in the middle of nowhere. So anyway, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to make an L bracket off of the RB bracket. It's going to just catch those two holes and then L down. I think it'll be a straight 90, not a not an angle. I don't need to put an angle on it with it going here. Um, and I'll just kind of put this thing something like this. Um, with it there. I don't have the cables, but with it there. You can see there is room for that connection to go in there. So I can get that terminal connected on the negative outlet. Um, there's plenty of room for me to get at the power plug. Plenty of visibility to the gauge when it's not covered up with this protective piece. And height-wise, it does clear the hood. Um, especially, you know, if, if it doesn't clear the hood perfectly, I can also still um, move the... Uh, voltage regulator that's got a little bit of length to it um, you could probably 
make another L bracket off of these bolts here and have it sitting vertically right there with nothing in the way. Of course, all this means that I then have to go back and figure out where to put my regulator and where to mount my air manifold. But the air manifold can really honestly go just about anywhere. Um, it'd be nice to keep it close to this general area because um, it should be somewhat close to that uh, regulator. Otherwise, I'm just wasting hose. You know, I gotta run the hose from the compressor into the manifold, and from the manifold into the regulator. And then the regulator has the two solenoids on it that then go out to the individual ARB lockers. So, you know, this is kind of the downside to running the air lockers is that there's some added complexity with the electric lockers. If you go selectable electric, it's just a straight run from the switch or solenoid from the switch to the axles. Um, I think it's worth it. I think it's a valuable trade-off. I think I end up ahead. I like the air lockers. They work well. As long as you're not breaking stuff. Um, and I'm also going to have to find a new way to mount this guy. That's the uh, the overflow for the PSC power steering. And I want to point out, I, I know a lot of people say, oh, you don't need it. You can just leave this off of here. Just put some sort of a cap on the hole. I just want to point this out. There is fluid in there. There's plenty enough fluid in there that I'm going to say it's not optional. At least not for me. If I didn't have that on there, I would have had that power steering fluid all over the place. And this is not... <laughs> It's not coming off right now, but it's not super full. It's properly loaded with fluid. Okay. Uh, gonna have the bracket mounted off of here, L down. I'll use this little gap here to put a small gusset. I'll probably put another one. The top piece will angle in. Um, should be pretty simple. Two gussets, angle, flat across, flat down. And I'm going to work with whatever steel plate I have that's less than a quarter inch thick. It doesn't need to be a quarter inch. I mean, it's got to have enough strength to support the weight of this thing. Both when I'm driving around just having it hanging there and also when I'm running 25 foot welding leads off of it. So, it will have to be slightly beefy, but it doesn't have to be a tank. Basically, the moral of the story. So, there. Gonna get after it. Alright, so. Looked around the shop. Some. Um, just under 316th. That'll do the job. Okay, so things are starting to take shape. We've got our plate. And just to show this, this is hot rolled steel. So it's cheaper than coal rolled. It's cheaper than the pickled and oiled. But it's also more work intensive. So it's a trade off. Um, and the trade off being, you can see this, this black one here. This here is clean metal. You know, I could clean it up just a tad more, maybe wipe it off with some acetone and it's ready to weld. This black stuff here is mill scale. So it's just whatever crud, carbon, oil, whatever gets burned onto the surface of the uh, metal as it's being rolled flat, I guess. I don't know. I've never seen the process done, but that's my assumption. Um, so basically, if you want to work with this stuff, you have to either chemically or mechanically remove 
the mill scale before you go trying to weld it. Um, if it's a temporary brace, temporary structure that you're using for limited strength needs, you could probably blow through it with thick rip welding. Most of my welding is MIG, and uh, it's just really not a good idea to try to blow through it. So, I will, if I need to weld it, which I am going to have to do some welding here, I will clean it up to the point where it's clean bare metal and then give it a wipe off with some acetone, not brake cleaner, uh, especially not the chlorinated brake cleaner. If you do use brake cleaner, you can end up releasing uh, gas. I forget what it is. It might be phosgene gas. Um, very harmful to breathe. can basically kill you. So <laughs> don't use brake cleaner. Acetone. Wipe it off. Weld in a well-ventilated area. So anyway, here's the plate. It's going to go something like this behind this. It'll sit up above it while catching both of the bolts, both the studs on both sides, so all four of them. Um, and the top lip will get bent over. Now it is 3 16 inch steel. I do not have a uh, press brake to do that kind of thickness. So what I'll do is I'll figure out where my line is that I want to bend and I'll score it with a cutoff wheel. And I'll go probably halfway through it, something like that. And then I'll put it into the vise and beat it into submission. Um, obviously that will severely weaken the metal. So then I will run down that seam with weld and then I'll grind the weld flush on the face that's going up behind the box because I need that to be flush. The top, I can leave the weld there, it doesn't matter, it won't affect anything. And I am not a pro fabricator, so if it looks like I made it at home, it's because I it did. Um, that's the thing. You know what? If it's going to work, if it's going to be safe, I'm okay with it not being store-bought and looking store-bought. Um, would I love to be some sort of a super-duper expert pro fabricator? Sure. That would be fantastic. That would be That's something to strive for. Those guys are amazing. Um, nothing but respect for what they do. However, for my home-built, beat-it-up Jeep, I do all right. You know, I got to figure out how to cover that hole out. I had to move the gas tank back. But, uh, you know, I welded in those shock towers. I think I did all right. And I have already driven this thing thousands of miles on the road. And driven on some pretty hard trails. So, I know they're holding. They're not coming out. You know, I put everything together on this thing. So, I've got some confidence. Heck, that tire carrier, you can see it's supporting a 40 inch tire. I built that tire carrier probably uh, 10, 12 years ago with a 110 uh, volt Sears Craftsman hardware um, welder, MIG welder. It's not perfect, and it's been modified to, to handle the 40. It was handling a 35 inch tire, but it did so for probably 80,000 miles. So, my stuff works. I'm not worried about it. Anyway, I've got to take some more measurements. I got to figure out. I've got a template inside for the the post holes, so I don't even have to meddle with trying to line those up and use marker got a paper template from the manufacturer so I can actually just lay it out on here and center punch right through the paper it's really nice of them to provide that um, and I'll probably get a marker and use the old bracket that was holding my air setup to mark the holes for the top mount so Let's see, I'm gonna, I knocked a marker off the table when I was cutting 
this played out. Obviously, a very cramped shop. So, make do. Uh, so here's what I was saying. I'm gonna take this plate and the marker in my hand. Come back over here. So, this was mounted right here. So, I know this bracket fits. It's actually got a little bit of extra room on it. But I know that fits. So, what I can do is I can take this plate, line it up along the two edges, and then from the back side. I can mark my holes and then center punch and drill. So that's what I'm gonna do now. Okay. So we got the plate drilled and those two bolts drop right down into that bracket. Just like I wanted. So now what I can do is you look from just the edge there. see maybe there's a an edge to the bracket right there so what I can do is get this good and squared up and then I can take that marker I had which I brought back in the garage so I'll have to go get it but I'll run that marker underneath it and I'll just put it up under here and just drag right across these two pieces. I don't care about this cutaway. I just need these two pieces right here. That face and that face. Because then what I can do is I can carry that line to the end on both sides. And I don't really care about that line on the back side. I need it on the top side. Because I'm going to have to score the top side so I can bend the whole thing over 90 degrees. I don't want to score the bottom side, I want to score the top. If I score the bottom, it honestly would work, but then when I go to weld it, the bead is going to be right up against. You know, I could put a fillet weld in that 90, um, but that's not how I'm going to do it. So, there we go. I'm gonna go find that marker, juggle the plate and draw my lines, and then I'll go trace the lines over to the other side of the plate, score it, and I'll probably go ahead and bend it. There's really not much reason not to. So, here we go. Okay, we got our lines marked. Not on that side. Let's move our bolts out of the way. We got them on the back side. Like I said though, I don't need them on the back side, I need them on the front side. So, here's what we're gonna do. Real simple. Carry those lines across. And get this stuff to get my tools to fit. Everything falling apart here. So, anyway. So, I've got that line that goes across. So, what I really want to do is mark the ends so I can see it from the other side. So, I'll flip this thing over. And now I can see on the end where those marks are and I can pick those up and I'm not really worried about this being square it may or may not be it doesn't have to be this bracket's gonna be what it needs to be in order to fit and if that means being square that means being square if that means being slightly off 
then that's what it needs to be in order to fit. So, that's what we got. We got the line, kind of follows where that is, where that is. It's not perfect, but uh, it should fit just fine. And like I said before, I am probably going to take this and probably cut some sort of an angle there to get that material out of there. And then wherever those holes go, I'm gonna cut out a large portion of the middle because I don't need all that extra weight. I don't need this much 3 16 inch steel plate to hold a battery box that's manufactured out of whatever that is, 16 gauge steel plate, or 16 gauge sheet metal. Um, you know, it's definitely a little bit of overkill, but it's what I have in the shop, and I think uh, I think the only other thing I got is 18 gauge sheet metal, which is going to be way too light. I don't want to go that way. So this is what it's going to get. Anyway, on to the next step. Okay, so here's the uh, the box template. And it's exactly as fancy as it needs to be, which is to say it doesn't need to be fancy. If you look at the back of that, and you look at those holes, those marked holes. Three, four. Okay, we found out a little bit of bad news. That template, that paper template was nowhere near, nowhere near accurate. Um, I had done a quickie check of it, and it looked eyeball like it was going to work. And so I did the dumb thing and drilled the holes and didn't line up. So got my magic fix. Piece of box, piece of cardboard. Um, so I'm going to fix it with my own template. I will line this up. I will punch those, uh, those studs through the cardboard. That'll give me my template. The important thing I need to remember is I need this thing to fit up against the master cylinder. So the important corner is this corner here. I need to make sure that this cardboard template lines up with those edges. As long as that lines up and that top line is reasonably square, I can then use this template to put the holes in the metal and go from there so live and learn double check the templates carefully not just spot checked i got a piece of plate with some holes in it now that can't be used for this i will find a use for it down the road i'm always picking up scraps out of the bin i actually have a paint bucket or whatever you want to call it, a five gallon bucket with a bunch of just cut off drops and old brackets and stuff that I dig through that all the time, looking for little odds and ends that'll work for small pieces. Um, in fact, that'll probably be where I... Well, no, I'll probably take the chunks for the gussets out of the extra material that I take off of this. But, uh... You know, it, it doesn't go to waste. It ends up getting used for something. So, here we go. I'm gonna basically line this up. I'll push it down real hard on those studs. Those studs are, are bolted in to the, the case so they won't go anywhere the cardboard will give it'll give me a, an indentation on there that looks good and straight there you know what this is a rough cut that I did this is the corner with the factory square cut from the box manufacturer. I'll use that corner. So that looks pretty good. What I'm going to do is put pressure right where those studs are. I want 
make sure I'm not concaving the cardboard and losing its shape. But there we go. You can see there's indentions. Now what I can do is I can run the drill bit through those and then use those to, to mark my template. Okay, we've got the template on there and you can see we got the holes through it and they all line up. Now I will use a slightly larger drill bit. I'll make one pass at this smaller bit and a second pass at a slightly larger bit. Um, give myself a little bit of wheel room just for alignment purposes. The clamping force of these, these nuts will be plenty to make sure it's not slapping around afterwards. So no problems with that. So now it's basically just figure out the alignment of this plate and then this will go like so and I could even just tape that on there and just run the drill right through it. In fact I might just do exactly that. Won't hurt anything. Templates throw away. So, I think that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm going to put a couple pieces of tape on it to hold it right where it is. Run the drill through. Job's your uncle. Okay, we got the plate on there. Um, obviously, it's not bolted on. The nuts are still on the back side. Uh, it's just sitting there loose. But we got some, some play so we can align it well. And it's ready to go. On to the next step and obviously i gotta go back and clean up all the the crust on here i'm gonna make my score line on the other side first before i go do anything else i already got the cutoff wheel on there so what i'll do i got my line drawn i'll run that across a couple of passes and then i'll change over to a, a wire wheel give that a good clean off especially in the area of the cut because I'm going to be welding there. I'll also flip it over and clean the back side because I am going to want to fit a little bit of uh, extra support on the back. So where I want to weld those gussets on I'm going to need to have clean. So I'm going to get after it get that score cut and get the wire wheel working. All right brackets kind of getting made. You got it on there, loosely bolted on, bend is made, you can see, I just kind of cut that, obviously I have not welded it yet, just going to bring it over to the Jeep. So we're making some progress on the install, got the bracket painted. Um, It's in place. I also ended up running this brown lead. There we go, the brown lead, which is ignition on through the uh, the rubber pass through down there into the cab and across through the dash to the uh, the main fuse harness or fuse panel and uh, jumped it into one of the um, switched power. Uh, fuses on the fuse block that has to be switched. This is right on the tag, it's kind of upside down, so I'm not going to be able to get it. But it says ignition live only with key on, uh, otherwise, it'll cause problems. So we're good to go with that. The other electrical connections are all very simple. There are two that need to go to power positive at the battery, one that needs to go to negative at the battery, one that needs to go to the alternator's uh, main power post, and two that are on a harness clip that will plug into the opposite clip on the new alternator. So those connections are all very straightforward. Um, to do that, I've got to get the alternator swapped out. Uh, I don't 
know if I'm getting that done tonight because we're starting to lose light. And, you know, it's just picking away at it after work. Uh, what I am going to do, um, I did play with the airline with the ARB pump. That's that black hose right here. Um, and I figured out that I can run it behind the uh, new welder and then I can mount this manifold very similar to how I had it on this mounting bolt um, so I'm going to get that done and that will give me part of the air hose situation figured out so I still have some stuff to figure out right? I got to get the manifold mounted I have to figure out what to do with my regulator and solenoid assembly these are the air solenoids for the two air lockers and they can't really get too far from where they are um, I think I got a little bit of wiring zip tied up in here but not a lot there's not a lot of slack in there so they can't live too far from here I may just honestly do something where I um, I might do something where I just end up running in, in here somehow. Something like that, but not exactly. Um, need to just verify that I can get to them. <clears throat> that I can swap them out in the event that one breaks out on the field. And that I can get to the regulator knob. I have to mount this relay. No big deal. It's a single single bolt. Um, I need to mount the voltage regulator. It can sit up on top of here, but I'm thinking it's getting too close to the hood and I'm not sure I want to leave it there. So I will probably find a different home for that. Um, again, I I'm going to be somewhat limited with the length of the harness, but I could build like an upright bracket and set it somewhere like that. You know, obviously not right there because that's going to block stuff. But at any rate, work in progress. I'm thinking about it. I got to figure it out. And then finally, that overflow for the power steering. Got to find a new home for him. So, it's just the way it works. But when you do a project like this, you figure out the biggest component first. You find a home for that because you can't, you can't tuck that big thing into somewhere. Um, reality is, this has got a huge bracket on it that doesn't necessarily need to be there. Um, and I could even separate the regulator from the solenoids. I could run a, a hose between them and it wouldn't hurt anything. So I could break those into smaller pieces is what I'm saying. This is a smaller piece than this. This is a smaller piece and the overflow is a smaller piece than this. This needed a big chunk of space. So figure that out first, then you get all the other stuff. Pick your battles one at a time. Little piece here, little piece there. Keep picking away at it. I'm not saying don't plan it out. You know, if, if you have the option, if you have complete directions, read them before you start. Get your plan of attack. Figure out what tools you're going to need. Figure out what room you're going to need. Figure out what you're going to have to remove or displace temporarily. And do all that. Um, but when you're in a situation like this where there is no book i mean they do have an instruction manual as far as the requirements the power setup all that kind of stuff but they don't have a manual for installing on a 2005 jeep wrangler unlimited with metal cloak overline fenders and a psc power steering hydraulic assist you know, they, they don't have that in the instructions. <laughs> That's just 
never going to be a case where they're going to have a book with that in it. Um, so, in this case, you just kind of have to figure it out. And like I said, take your time. Piece by piece, work from the big pieces. Get those figured out first. Make room for them. Once you have those figured out, you move on to the next piece. And eventually you run out of pieces. Eventually you're all done. So. Anyway. Like I said, I'm going to probably take that one bolt out, put that one bolt back in with that bracket on there, and then move on with my knight and go inside. <laughs>